while we're waiting for them to be released, we're going over to Psalm chapter 78 this morning. So Psalm 78. See, it's actually a perfect video because it ties right into what I was going to speak on this morning. And it's, it's pretty neat how God works stuff. Didn't find the video until after I had the sermon done. It was only like the second one I looked at. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool how God ties everything together. So I, before I get started, obviously I forgot. Happy Father's Day, all you dads. Um, I know everyone else has said it, and I feel it's important I say it too, so... All right, so Psalm chapter 78, verses 1 through 8. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this word this morning. Lord, I I pray that it's an encouragement. I pray that it's it's an uplifting to the men and women of this church, Lord, as as we walk out the path that you have before us, Lord, that you would continue to, to teach us and guide us. Lord, completely strip me away from this message. And Lord, let this just come off as as your words, not as my words. Lord, send your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this chapter in Psalm, Psalm 78, is actually a continuation of Psalm 77. Psalm 77 was looking at the, the history of Israel. And that started from Abraham and went through uh, Moses And then from here we pick up and we go through into captivity in this chapter. Now if we if we look at this from a father's perspective, this actually has a lot to do with fathers and mothers, you can get something out of this as well. Remember when I did the Mother's Day sermon, I said, Moms, pay attention, dads don't fall asleep. Today it's the exact opposite. Moms, stay awake. There's something here for you too. I'm speaking directly to the men, but you women folk, you're part of this as well. And yes, I even put women folk in there. Are fathers special people? It's probably the first question I need to ask. Are they special people? Definitely. And it doesn't matter whether you're a biological dad, a stepdad, a surrogate dad. We all have similar things that we need to understand as being men. There's something huge that we have in common. The enemy wants to destroy us. The enemy wants to totally wipe us out so we don't exist and we can't fulfill what God really wants us to fulfill. See, being a father or not, the enemy is scared to death of us being men. Am I right? You should get an amen on that. Let's try it again. The enemy is scared to death of us just because we're men. All right, there we go. It's, It's truth. The enemy wants to destroy us. When we go back to the garden... And he had Adam and Eve there. Oh, wait, let's go before Eve. Because before Eve, that's when the circumstances came together. The guard the, guard the garden. Protect the garden. Name the animals. Don't eat of this tree. That promise was all given before Eve was even on the scene. That was all given to Adam in advance. So we're the ones who have total dominion. When we look at the American family unit today, what do we see? Fractured. Yes. I would say fractured isn't a strong enough word, but fractured is a very good word. It's, it's strong. Broken pieces off. 
I want to start this morning with a little bit of stats on the American family. If a kid in the family comes to the Lord first, meaning a child comes to the Lord first, there's only a 3 to 5% chance that the rest of the family will get saved. If mom gets saved and mom starts going to church first, there's only a 17% chance that the rest of the family will get saved and come to church. Now if dad, dad steps up and dad's the one who gets saved and dad's the one who puts the emphasis on church, 93% of the entire family will get saved. 93%. So men, how important are we? How important are we to this next generation? How important are we to this generation right now? We're huge. We have a huge impact. Now, men, take your hands just for a second. Ladies, you can do this too. Take your hand. Hold it up. Okay. Put down all of your fingers but your pinky. Okay. That is essentially the comparison of your wife or the mother of your children's capability to get the entire family saved. Now, when you look at that pinky and you think to yourself, as a man, how much work can you do with your pinky other than pick your ear and pick your nose? What else can you do with it? Okay, you can pick up a couple of small things. <clears throat> but, but men, men, when, when you are fully engaged in your family, it's like using your whole hand to do a task. You now have full functionality to grasp, do what needs to be done, hit stuff, do what needs to be done in order to make it happen. Okay, you can put your fingers down. <laughs> See, today's message is also, it's a reminder of the Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 message that Moses gave to Israel from God. He gave this message to them. And we'll flip to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. And when Moses penned these words, these words are just as true today as they were then. And they should really be the motto of our lives, something that we're striving for, whether we have biological parents, stepkids, or surrogate parents, whatever. These are words we should strive for. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. And these words that I command to you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. <laughs> the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now when it says between your eyes, I mean, think about your nose. It's always there in front of you, but you don't see it. This is out in front of you. It's something that's a constant reminder that it's there. How many of you guys ever get a migraine? You get the floaters? Yeah, the floaters is like the symbol of, oh no, oh no, but it's a constant reminder of the pain that's coming, isn't it? Until that pain is there, and then you know. So Psalm 78 is, is a repeat of this. It's a reminder. How many of you know that every time you see something in Scripture and it's said more than once, it's probably something important that you need to grasp and you need to have a part of in your life? This happens to be one of those. This is one of those that we have in our life. This is one of those that as a parent, we need to take extremely serious. God wanted the nation of Israel to pass along to the next generation what was important. However, they kind of screwed up a lot. Church, we're expected to do the same, pass along, try not to mess up, and when we do mess up, what do we do with the mess up? Try to fix it, ask forgiveness, work through it, move on. Today's sermon is entitled, The Church, A Father's Legacy, because legacy is important. I mean, all of us in this room want to leave some sort of legacy, right? We want somebody to remember us after we're gone, right? So today we're going to talk about the legacy in the church. We've talked about the church having eternal purpose. We've talked about the church through devotion. Today, through legacy, through fathers. So Psalm 78, verse 8, <clears throat> where we originally started, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. 
a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. See, this entire chapter should remind the nation Israel and us as well as an example that when we're following God, we're going to make mistakes, but the important thing is, is to get past those. Otherwise, if we don't get past those, we, don't, we keep making the same mistakes, what happens? Is there a punishment that comes our way because of that? There definitely is. There definitely can be. The nation Israel, they were made captives and they were dispersed. The bad fathers are not to be followed into their wickedness, but how should we follow them? Into their, into their goodness. Into the things that they did right. Just like the video. You had the dad who was out there and he says to the kid, I'll destroy your video games if you don't get off that. And the kid's standing there screaming as dad's running the push mower over it. <clears throat> so we're going to look at three forms of legacy today. Three forms of legacy that every father, every parent should strive to leave their kids. Number one this morning is a legacy of love. A legacy of love. <clears throat> 78 verses 1 through 3, I'll read those again. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. See, one of the saddest phrases that I've ever heard, and I, I am ashamed to say I've heard it more than once, come out of a parent's mouth who I know is a Christian. And I hate this phrase because it's so twisted and wrong. I'm not going to force my religious beliefs on my kid. I'm going to let them make and decide for, their, for themselves say that again. I'm not going to force my religious beliefs on my kids. I'm going to let them decide on their own. Whenever I hear that, it makes me sick. Because <clears throat> if we are true Christians, wouldn't we have love for our kids? Wouldn't we want them to have the same peace and same knowledge of Jesus Christ that we have? Wouldn't we want them to experience his presence, the grace of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and, and a loving father, a good, good father? Wouldn't we, wouldn't we want that in our lives, in their lives, in their kids' lives, in their kids' 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 lives? And let's just go right on down the family tree till Jesus comes back. That's what we want. I mean, how many parents do you know would sit there and see a kid playing on the railroad tracks and let the kids play on the railroad tracks and not do anything? See, being a Christian, we, we look at that. We look at a kid playing on the railroad tracks. We don't hear the train. We don't know the train's there, but, you know, we know it's coming eventually. What do we do? We tell the kids to get off the track because we love them. We care about them. Come on. Come to safety. Come over here and play in an area where we don't have to worry. Love will warn, love will encourage, love will assist and help to make the right decisions. And that number one right decision is the safety in Jesus. Our verse starts today with, with incline your ears in the ESV and a bunch of other versions as well. The NET puts it this way, listen to the words I speak. Listen to the words I speak. There's an importance to getting them to listen. Now, Jamie and I, we have family meetings occasionally. We had one yesterday because uh, we're getting ready to move soon. And the, the homeowners contacted me yesterday and said, hey, you guys can start to move stuff into the building we've called the cave. So um, we're going to start doing that today. So I had a family meeting. We got everyone together in the living room. I sat down. I put my special crown on, got out my gavel. The whole nine yards, it's wonderful. Jamie sits in the corner. She's taking notes feverishly because she's got to write up minutes for this meeting. <clears throat> you guys think I'm kidding, don't you? Yeah. I am kidding. <laughs> she has a stenograph thing that she... No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Set her for classes on shorthand the whole nine yards. <laughs> it's getting deep in here. I should probably stand on a chair. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, we had this meeting. The first thing I did was I said, hey, everyone be quiet. Don't, don't talk. Let me speak what we got to talk about. Laid out some order of things as to what we wanted to do. And then I said, okay, 
Now question time, answer. But you know what, there was quiet there. So everybody now in my family is held accountable. They know exactly what we're doing later today. They know the process and some of the steps that we're gonna go through. Right, Jelly? Right, Jaden? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let it go on the record, she says what? But you see, when everyone's quiet, everyone's spending time together, and you say, hey, listen, you can get a focus on your kids. I've done the same thing with, with teachings with them as well, scriptural teachings. I mean, something will just hit me when I'm reading, or something will hit me in a lecture I'm listening to, or something's going to hit me in a conversation I had with somebody, and all of a sudden, it's like, boom, the light bulbs go off. I have to sit down with my kids and say, hey, I just learned this, okay? Even at my age, I still explain to my kids things. God's still speaking to me. He, hopefully he's speaking to every single one of us in this room still. Now the teaching in parables, when it says that, it's, it's, it's amazing because Jesus is the master of teaching in parables. If you really want to understand the parables in the New Testament, they're not super hard. They're actually kind of easy. As you're going through and as you're studying them, all you have to do is understand some of the historical significance that was taking place in that time, and you can have such a depth of scripture. When he says, I will open my mouth, I will utter dark sayings. When I see the words dark sayings, the first thing that pops in my head because of my age and such would be the, the dark web. How many of you are familiar with the deep dark web? Okay, a couple of you. I was, told, I was told not to go there because I could find a way to buy a kidney off the deep dark web, and I thought that would be pretty cool, but I don't have the kind of funds to afford it. So, But... There's a deepness and a darkness that's there. Now what this is actually talking about is it's a deep, dark saying. It's, it's more like a riddle. It's meant to be confusing, but not confusing as in you can't understand it. The deep, dark sayings are meant to be hard for you to understand, but you've got to work through it, and then you can have a deeper understanding of them. So they're more of a hard question or a discussion to have whenever you see a deep, dark saying, or a dark saying. Which brings us to Proverbs chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. I'll just read this one to you guys. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you, love her, and she will guard you. Dads, if you've got wisdom, should you be passing that on to your kids? Mom, if you've got wisdom, should you be passing it on to your kids? Definitely, definitely. See, those hard questions, those hard conversations are the ones that your kids will grow in wisdom as well. You're setting them up for something else in the future. You're casting a memory, a good memory. See, I still remember a lot of the good conversations I had with my dad. I remember some of the bad conversations. I remember getting whippings because I deserved them. I remember these things. But I still remember the discussions that we had. He explained a lot to me. I mean, one of the simple ones that I remember he explained to me when I was probably 12 years old, he taught me how to wire my first outlet. And he, he explained to me, black is hot, white is neutral, and the copper is ground. And then... We had that discussion, and then we went over to a car, and he popped the hood open, and he says, which one's the hot? I said, the black one. No, no, it's the red one. <laughs> but I'll never forget that conversation because it was a learning that took place. Now when I wire stuff, if it comes with a black power cord and it's going to a car, I kind of freak out, and I still run the black cord because I'm too cheap to go buy the other one. But... I, I have to remember, red is positive. So when you hook that up, you hook the right side up to the battery. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I know a lot of these are very common verses for us today, but they, they have the heavy meaning and they speak to us in love. See, that verse in Proverbs takes some faith as well as the parent. It takes some faith. Because does everyone's kid end up being a Christian that you've raised in a Christian household? 
and you've explained how to be a Christian too. Has that happened? Sorry to say it hasn't. It's sad when it doesn't. But it takes faith that you're going to raise them the right way to get them to the end goal of being saved in Christ. See, love has a sacrifice side as well. There are a lot of days, I'll be honest with my kids, I would much rather just go goof off and do my own thing, hobbies, mow lawn, shovel snow, something like that, than hang out with them. <clears throat> but as they get older, I take them out with my hobbies. I take them fishing. I take them hunting. I take them over to cut grass at, at our land. I take them over to cut brush. It's nice. It's handy. I have somebody to move the brush after I cut it. It's wonderful. <laughs> Carve out time. Make them a priority. Make your kids a priority. Number two, our second, our second legacy today is a legacy of courage. Psalm 78, 4 through 5. We will not hide them from our children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. See, we will not hide them. There was a, a grandfather who was telling me that he got saved later in life. His kids were probably 16, 17, 18 years old at the time that he came to the Lord. Unfortunately, he didn't have as much impact over the kids being two, three, four, five years old and coming to the Lord. He had a very short window. He did everything he could with that short window to introduce them to the Lord and, and get that relationship set and that foundation in place. He tried. His kids went off to college. They got married. They had kids. He says, you know what? Now I have grandkids. I might have been late for my kids, but I'm not too late for my grandkids. Even though his kids have said, oh, do you have to take them to church? He still, every week, says, yeah, I'm going to take them to church. He's being very steadfast, very courageous with his kids, knowing full well his kids could say, you're done. No more. But instead, he's still stepping up. He's still bringing his grandkids to church every week. He still spends time studying the Bible with them, reading to them, encouraging them. Isn't that a beautiful story? He wants them to know how awesome Jesus really is. Just last weekend, a friend of mine was going through some stuff, and he says, can you meet me at such and such a diner? I said, yes. So we went, we sat down for breakfast, and when you walk into the diner, the way they got it set up, you walk in, you turn a hard right, you turn a hard left, and boom, there's a table right there, right next to the entrance. What table do you think we got? That one. Not one of the ones spread out. We took that one right by the door. Right before our meal comes, said, okay, which of us is going to pray? He says, you know what, you pray. It's okay. Two grown men sitting down in the middle of the diner. We started praying right next to the door. I heard the door open. A couple come in. I pray with my eyes open when I'm out to eat because you don't know what's going to happen. I, I watched this. I watched, as I was looking down, I watched two feet walk by, and I kind of saw them stop and turn and wait. As they stopped and turned and waited, I finished my prayer. Amen. I got a hearty amen in response. And it was a couple. They were so happy and excited to see a couple of young guys in a diner out in public praying. Seeking God for their family, seeking God for just a simple meal as well. Men, praying in, praying in a restaurant, super easy. But you know what? It shows a conviction to your kids that this is important. This is the way that we need to live. This is the way we need to follow God. Thank you for the amens. That was great. How many of you have ever been mocked in a restaurant for praying? Just me? No, you don't. You're, you're a bigger guy than me. But <laughs> I get mocked sometimes. And you know what? This is another opportunity to show a heart of, well, sorry I didn't hit your, your mood today, but I worship the Lord with my family and leave it at that. And 
Don't go any further. Don't try to have an argument. Don't try to force the other person into your belief, whatever. Let them go and let them have to give an account to the Lord. Keep that upon them. You know what, that speaks another thing to your kids as well, that they don't need to fight. They can live in courage and not fight. Our third legacy this morning, our third legacy this morning, I, I believe is, is probably the biggest one because it's, it's of the utmost importance of what we've been talking about this morning. It's a legacy of reverence or honor for the Lord. I'll say it again. A legacy of honor or reverence for the Lord. And this is Psalm 78, 6 through 7. That the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. See, the reverence and honor that we show to the Lord in our lives is something that's going to rub off. It's something that our kids are going to mirror. See, there was more to those stats this morning that I didn't get into you with you guys. Mom and Dad, if you bring your kids to a midweek service, you make that a priority. You take them to Bible study. You take them to Sunday school. The things that you make a priority now, they're over 75% more likely to participate in those activities as they become adults. That's huge. That's huge. The number of them that go that aren't forced to go, it's a very low number, less than 10%. Let that sink in. See, the one really true, truly special thing that we get to give our kids is the legacy of love and courage that we can pass down through our remembrance of doing the things that the Lord has put out before us. The things that we pass on. How do we do that? Well, there's a few things that we can do to help pass that on to our kids. It comes through the spending of the time, doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Get up early, read your scripture. Get up early, spend time in prayer. Seek the Lord at night before going to bed. Speak, seek the Lord with your family. Be a man that the world can't touch. We started this morning, I said 93% of families have the greatest impact for Jesus because dad is going to Jesus first. It's important that we stay plugged in as men. We need to make this a priority, have the most impact on our kids. Ephesians 6.4, which speaks to the amount of impact we can have. Ephesians 6.4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's really hard to sit there and tell a kid, do as I say, not as I do. What kind of impact do you have when you tell your kids, go do this, go do that, but you're not willing to do it yourself? What's that tell your kids? It tells them, it's important for you to give it to them as busy work, but it's not important for you to do it yourself. I'm stopping on toes, I'm sorry. See, there's, there's a point in time in our lives as, as parents, as fathers, that we can only go so far. There's only so much that we can do. We're going to hit a point where we stop. Usually it stops with the last breath, the last heartbeat. And you know what? That, that's when there's no more teaching. That's when there's no more educating. That's when there's no more lifting up. That's when there's no more that you can do as a parent for your kid. I'm reminded of, of a couple of things with this. The, the first one being the cheerleaders. I know, how would I get the cheerleaders on this? But you ever watch the cheerleaders? You've got the guy standing on the bottom. You've got the other cheerleader jumps up, and then they hold the cheerleader up. They're, they're hanging on to the feet of the cheerleader. See, we as parents, we should be setting our kids up that, that our ceiling is so high. And then when, when our kids take over and it's their turn to step in, 
our ceiling becomes their floor. We're, we're like that cheerleader holding up, up by their feet. They're not sitting on our shoulders. They're not going just a little bit beyond us, but we're holding their feet. We're pushing them up so high. We're their foundation. Exactly. It, now think about that. As you get three or four generations down the road, because of you holding up, and you teach your kids to hold up as well, and the next one holds up as well, think about how high that can go. Think about how close to the Lord that's going to be and how, what an impact that's going to make. See, this takes me to John chapter 3, or excuse me, not John 3, 3 John verse 4. Get the right address. 3 John verse 4, because there's only one chapter. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. What a treasure. What a treasure statement that is. As a father, I believe we all believe that way. I love nothing more than to hearing my kids come back with the truth, come back with something, and I know they're walking with the Lord because that's the only way they could have gotten that truth is if God revealed that to them. See, I, I love, I loved, Nate, you're going to love, and Melissa, you're going to love the youth ministry as you guys continue. You're going to love it because, like, some of the experiences, um, like with Alexis, I mean, she's come and she's asked me a lot of questions over these few years. Extremely proud, once again, you're graduating this weekend. Like I said, you're an extension of my family. And there's others as well. I mean, there's a lot of kids in the ministry that have been through over the years that I've kind of adopted as my kids. That's probably the only part of the youth ministry I really miss. The, the overnighters, the drama. Yeah, you can have it all. <clears throat> I'll help with conference this year because I understand your situation. I mean, I, I love some of the deep theological questions. Like, like, here's one of the deep theological questions that actually, yes, led to a half-hour conversation with some youth. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Another question that I was recently asked on Thursday that I know was brought up on Thursday was, if you are blind, how do you know? <laughs> hey, if you bring stupid stuff up, it's going to be in a sermon. So each one of these questions, though, don't they bring a truth? Isn't there a way you can kind of bring those back and work them back to Scripture? Yeah, and you can further the, the lesson, further the, the explaining. How do you know if you're blind? It's not a one-time thing, I promise you. I've known you long enough. It's not a one-time thing. <laughs> I have to continue because we're about to close. <laughs> If you have a parent, a surrogate mother or father, biological mother or father, stepmom or dad, they introduce you to the Lord that extended your knowledge of God or, or made that introduction. They lived the life before you. You know what? On this Father's Day, there's nothing greater, in my opinion, than walking up to them and saying, Dad, thank you. Thank you for being the man of God. Thank you for leading your children and who Jesus wants them to be. Thank you for, for teaching them what the scripture says and educating them and, and living a life that's, that's of glory to the Lord. See, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7, it's a great reminder. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. See, a father isn't just a father. I mean, you don't just do that one thing and then that's it. There's more to it than that than being a father. You're to be a mentor, a teacher, a disciplinarian, and a friend. He's an example to sons and daughters of what a man should be and how deeply and unconditionally our Heavenly Father loves us. See, I want you to get that. We're an example here on earth for our kids of what God is and what God wants. <clears throat> we will fail. He never will. There are a ton of great dads out there. Is the legacy you're leaving 
the legacy you truly want to leave? Is the legacy that you're leaving the legacy you truly want to leave? Dads, moms as well. You can listen. If you believe you're not leaving the legacy you want to leave, it's real simple. Make the changes today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow never gets here. Make the changes today. Make them now. You can leave a legacy of love, courage, and devotion to the Lord. You can do that in your children and your children's children and right on down through because you've made some decisions. Now you have three steps. Three steps this morning. Step one, think about the way you love. As a dad, think about the way you love. What kind of love do you need to show your kid to meet their needs? What kind of things do you need to do? See, in the movie, the dad ran over the video games, but in reality, he sits down with the kid and has fun time with the kid. Is that going to show a huge impact to the kid? Even if you hate the video game, you hate video games. Spend 10 minutes sitting down with your kid playing a flipping video game. It's not that hard. I do like video games. <clears throat> I did play Call of Duty. It was a fun game. See, be willing to participate in what their interests are because when you do that, it shows a greater revelation to them that you're willing to set aside yourself and your own ambitions for them. It shows a huge amount of love. Step two, operate in a holy courage. Be courageous. Operate in a holy courage. Holy courage, be courageous. See, don't back down when the world around you tells you you can't be a Christian. When the world around you tells you you can't worship Jesus, stand firm. Respond in all situations as he would respond. Remember, he didn't always tie the, the braided whip and go in and clear the temple, kick over tables. A lot of times he was gentle in his response. Step three. Live a life that honors the Lord. Step three, live a life that honors the Lord. You do this by making him a priority in all things that you do, in all your decisions. You do this by spending time in prayer, by spending time in the word, selecting appropriate entertainment choices as well, whether it's music or movies. Make appropriate choices. Fatherhood is not just a responsibility. It's not just a responsibility a man meets. It's not just a purpose he fulfills. It's a legacy he lives in the life that he touches after him. If you do these three things that I just mentioned, you will leave a legacy in your kids that will live on for generations. Let's pray. Father God, I'm going to make this prayer this morning personal to me. And I ask that the other fathers here will, will follow the lead and, and want this for themselves as well. Father God, I thank you for the encouragement of the areas that I'm meeting the mark of your word and being the father you want me to be. I ask with your wisdom to be able to see the areas I fall short, the areas I can improve. I ask that you would help me to meet the mark that I can ob obtain the, the abounding joy in them later in life. Lord, help me to guide and lead Jaden, Jillianna, Joniah, and Jonathan. Insert your own kids' names. You can pray for mine too if you want. In the way that they should go. Lord, help me to be the man that you've called me to be as I set you as the highest priority in my life. Lord, I thank you for this morning's service. I thank you that you amazingly show up week after week for us again and again as our, as our Heavenly Father. Thank you for being that perfect Father, sending his Son Jesus as the perfect, perfect gift that we are heirs with him and as such sons of yours sons of yours through the adoption. Lord, sear this word into our hearts this morning that we may excel in leading the next generation and changing the, changing the trend, changing the way the world is operating today. 
In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, one more quick reminder. As you guys are running out for some Father's Day cake, yum, yum. Anybody who is interested in being baptized next week, please speak to me so that this way I kind of put together an order and we can kind of discuss some details as well. Um, other than that, you guys are dismissed. Happy Father's Day. Hope you guys all have a blessed, super awesome day. Thank you. Thank you.